is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode of Superior Sports Talk presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. What's happening, Reggie? Man, it was a late night last Oof. night. Messing around with those wild, and mm. they uh, they messed around and took the L, man. Dang. Yeah, I mean, you know, some days we get to come in here and record after a fun day in Minnesota sports. Mm-hmm. It's all smiles, butterflies, rainbows, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately today is not that kind of day. After the wild collapse in the third period, they lose game five. And the Twins, they don't even get a hit until the eighth inning. They lose to the Astros 5 nothing. We'll get you all caught up with all the action from last night. Plus, later on, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean. It's all coming up on Superior Sports Talk. But first, make sure to check out our other daily show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. It's the Ron Johnson Show, featuring former Gopher and NFL receiver Ron Johnson and producer Sam Ekstrom. Get the daily opinions of an athlete turned broadcaster. Ron Johnson tells it like it is, whether it's Vikings, Gophers, Wolves, or Twins. Subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel or podcast feeds so you never miss an episode. All right, well, Minnesota Wild lose last night 5-2 after that third period collapse. We get to see every night, it seems like, a legit superstar blossoming in front of our very own eyes in Kirill Kaprizov. When the lights were the brightest in the biggest game of his young career, all the guy does, go out and score two power play goals early, Mm -hmm. single-handedly just trying to will his team to victory. But as Seth Topal said on last night's post-game reaction on Lockdown Wild, it just seemed like the Wild couldn't find the Robin to their Batman in Kaprizov Mm -hmm. in the scoring department. I mean, the kid can only do so much until it's time for someone, anyone, to step up up behind him and make a play in the wild they've been unable to find that other option next to Kaprizov really this this whole playoff series it seems like you sit back you watch this kid you can't help but just be mesmerized by not just the goals but the effort the determination he plays with stick handling the ability to create big plays with that strength and speed but ultimately it's a team game. It's unrealistic. It's unfair, really, to ask one guy as young as he is to do it all. And they just needed someone else to spark some life into the team. And they were just nowhere to be found last night. Head coach Dean Evison said after the game, pretty bluntly, he said, hey, if we had 20 Caprizoffs, we'd never <laughs> lose. But yeah. we, we need more from other guys. It can't just be about him. So... Their Batman was dominant once again, gave him a chance to win, but the Wild never had anyone step up as Robin last night. Man, that's tough. It it hurts. I remember uh, yesterday in the first period, um, Kaprizov pretty much got backed into a corner Mm -hmm. and double teamed into the corner of the ice. And the dude, like, it's like he had eyes in the back of his head. Somehow he was able to get out of the double team and he gets the puck and passes it between his legs to Matt Zuccarillo. And Matt just, Matt just missed it. Like, he, it was like, you ever seen like when like Chris Paul or Luca or, you know, one of these guys, you know, LeBron. Just passes, just this ridiculous, like no, no look, look. Like these yeah, instincts. just like, like, yeah, like the, yeah, the, the Magic Johnson, he, he, you know, <laughs> one of those, and, and then the the guy that he passes it to, just like air balls, you just like, right. Dang, like not man, expecting, you, like when when you're on the ice with a guy like Caprizov, yeah. just like when you're on the court with those other guys, you have to be alert and expect something crazy or magical to happen. At any point, you got to be ready because, like you said, you just never know when they're going to pull out something out of their hat, man. Those crazy yeah. instincts, like you mentioned. And, and and so when I saw that, and then there was a couple times where they had a legitimate chance to score, and mm-hmm. they shoot it over the net, or they shoot it to the left of the net, or to the right of the net. And when I saw those things last night, I was just like, you know. That's not a good sign. No. And then when Double K scored his first goal, I was like, okay, all right, okay, never mind. You know, tied it up. And then he scored again. I was just like, oh, shoot, it's about to be one of those nights. 
And then there was no more scoring after that. And it was just like, uh, okay. And, you know, we talked about how we were hoping that Kevin Fiala would kind of pick it up, you know, didn't last night. Like maybe we, we, are we, are we wrong to expect some goals from him? I, I feel like, you know, they, they powered up, built this team to win. And you're telling me that in a, a pivotal game five, you can only score two goals. Like, and it's, it's only from Kaprizov. Like, that is tough. And then when you got the coach saying, like, if we had more Kaprizovs, we'd be in better shape. It's just like, dang, like, that's an indictment on the team. Like, where's where's Jeek? Mm. You know, where's, you know, Zuccarello? Where's Boldy? Where, you know, all these guys that are expected to be great complimentary pieces to Kaprizov, like, it's nowhere to be found, man. And that... That was, I think, the most disappointing part for last night because I feel like the Wild had every reason to win that game last night and just let it slip away. Yeah, the Wild, they're four for 19 on power plays. Kaprizov has scored three of them. I mean, Kaprizov, he also leads the NHL playoffs with seven goals this postseason. Just a sign for things to come from him in the future. If they can find the right support around him, finally they put it all together, but they're just left grasping straws right now saying who's going to be the other guy to step up. Worth noting, you mentioned Dean Evason. He said for losing that game the way they did, he thought the team's body language and attitude was in pretty good spirits. They feel like they're ready to go back to St. Louis Thursday, tie this thing back up, get back they to better. Work. But when you look ahead to that game, is there any chance this is the time now to go to Cam Talbot in the net? Remember, the Blues looking to get some new momentum and change up their luck. They decided to put in Jordan Bennington in the net game four, and that obviously has worked out well for them. Do you think the Wild could look to copy the same philosophy, kind of shake things up after losing the last two games and allowing 10 goals collectively? What do you have to lose? You know, I mean, that's what I'm saying, right? You got a, you got a, a an elimination game now. Your back is against the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, you've tried flower and net for the most of the series. I think it is a little scary to bring Cam Talbot just off the, off the bench, in this high stakes situation when he hasn't played all series long. I, I think that's kind of scary. And there's here's the thought. It's like, look, you do what you've done to get here you know don't go away from it now because you know things have gotten messed up and it's just like there are some people that may look at flowers performance and say like oh, okay it's not all on him you know it, it's it's not all on him but there's others you know i i posed the question on twitter last night who do the wild start in net in game six mm -hmm. and an overwhelming majority of people said you got to start Cam Talbot. Mm. And I'm just like, well, I don't know. Here you, I mean, I guess. But you know what? I will point out something. And maybe people don't want to hear this. But what did you just say before you asked that question? You said they were four for 19 on power play. That's one of the big issues right there. Like, they are not taking advantage of these power plays. Oh, no doubt. As they as they should. And that's been killing them even more than the goaltending, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because I think Flower has been good enough. You know, there, there are some that, you know, have gotten past them and all that stuff. And, you know, I got people in my, in my mentions talking about he's washed and – you know, all the we're seeing the deterioration of him before our eyes, and I'm just like, eh, I don't, I don't know if I, if I would go that far. Like, the dude can still do his thing. Like, he's still a dude. We've seen it. I mean, just game one. You know, all together. Like, I understand they gave up four goals, but like, man, the dude has some incredible saves in that first game before they gave up those four goals and 0 for like, 6 on the power play in game one too to your point 0 yeah, for 6 yeah, I mean it's so not all on this goalie here. it's no. not but I will say if you want to switch some things up shake some things up mm -hmm. put some fire underneath 
the team, maybe you do go for a switch because it's just like, you know, what do you have to lose at this point? And Cam Talbot has shown that he has, some would argue, been the better goaltender Mm -hmm. since Flower came along. 13-0-3 heading into the playoffs, but only a 15-15 and postseason record. So we know we talked about it yesterday in, in depth. That's why they went out and got the veteran flurry. How about but no time like the present to turn No time around. like the present. How about this scenario? Let's just say they fling out Cam Talbot and they win game six. Mm-hmm. Then what do you do in game seven? Oh, you got to put them out there on game seven. Be, but, you know, devil's advocate, the, the people are going to rebuttal with, but that's why you went out and got flurry for game seven in the playoffs. Yeah. Oh, that's nice that experience but you're totally right if if cam gets flung out in game six and they win it how do you pull him at that point i don't know if vegas has the odds out right now i'd just be very curious to see what the actual odds are right now is it flurry or is it cam talbot wild are and do or die now as they head back to st louis thursday in that must win game six puck drops tomorrow night 8 30 p.m central standard rest assured Reggie and I will be here Friday to break it all down. Coming up, we're talking some Twins baseball as they took on Justin Verlander and the Astros last night. And later on, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat. But first, do you want some smart post-game reaction from insiders that cover your favorite teams? Check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Get instant reactions from Locked On team hosts along with prominent reporters like Kevin Gorg for the Wild and Brandon Warren for the Twins. No fluff, just 10 minutes of straight analysis after each game. Subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube and never miss a podcast. All right, well, Reggie, the Wild lose last night, so Minnesota fans hoping to get a little love from the Twins on the side, but Justin Verlander, he had other plans. 39-year-old two-time young award winner missed all of last season with Tommy John surgery, but you'd never know it. I mean, he was looking peak condition last night, a no-no going through eight innings. Gio Ursula broke up that bid with a single the bottom of the eighth. Twins couldn't capitalize, though, couldn't really get anything going. Joe Ryan looked a little off last night compared to what we're used to seeing, Mm -hmm. struggling to find the strike zone a little bit, issuing a walk in each of his five innings, allowing four runs. Twins lose this one 5-0. They scraped by with some of that young talent we talked about in the last few days without their studs, Byron Buxton and Carlos Correa. But that was against the A's. Now that they're playing some big boy competition here, it's clear they're going to need more guys to step up and get production out of other than, again, Buxton and Correa until they return. Otherwise, we could see them kind of come back down to earth a little bit these next few series. Yeah, so I think what we saw last night was them running into a future Hall of Famer. Mm. Justin Verlander is 76 years old. (laughs) <laughs> and the dude the Minna. dude is still a dude like i just think it's crazy that someone that age is still producing like that like you're you're going on 40 years old and you got a no hitter going like what yeah. like are you serious like i i think they just ran into greatness last night and it's tough man because the, the Twins have been playing so well, and then you get dealt a blow with Correa going on the IL yesterday, and also Chris Paddock. And they're they're mm. even, like, whispering that Paddock may need some surgery, mm. maybe. Uh-oh. And it's like, yo, you traded your top reliever to get Chris Paddock because you felt like he could help bolster that starting rotation. And, you know, we talked about, like, the next man up, next man. Yeah, it's only next man up for a temporary, you know, time. But if you're talking about possible surgery for Chris Paddock, then that next man up is just the guy at that point because, like, you're not going to have him for a while. And anytime you start talking about elbow tightness, elbow discomfort, and things like that, and we're only, like, what, less than a month into the season yeah 30 games if that yeah yeah like that is not that that's not very promising Mm -hmm. and so you know you would like to think that joe ryan is not going to have that type of performance all the time you know like not every pitcher is dominant every outing you know they you know some pitchers 
have a, a clunker here or there. And so you would like to think Joe Ryan will come back around. He's just, you know, he's learning. He's learning on the fly, which, you know, rookie pitchers, they take their lumps. And so, you know, you would hope that he will stabilize after a performance like this. But, you know, you talk about all the injuries that are mounting up for this Twins team and, you know, then you come out and have that type of performance against the Astros. They may come out tonight and and win six to two or something like mm-hmm. that. And maybe you're just like, all right, never mind. We're 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 just you know over analyzing one game. Yeah, the sky but, is not falling. We're fine. Yeah. Yep. But you know, you you look at what happened last night, and you take into account everything that's going on with this team, and you're just like, uh, you know, it, it's a little cause for concern, but. You kind of see how this series shakes out, and then you kind of go from there. After those first two, three weeks, it's like, oh, my gosh, maybe we have too many pictures. We got six <laughs> quality pictures. But then Bundy and now Paddock, and all of a sudden things look really thin and really scary here when you look at the long stretch of baseball yet to be played. We'll see how that all plays out. You know, Back to Verlander for a second, though. Man, how impressive is that? I didn't realize this. He's only pitched one game in the last two years. Wow. He had that Tommy John last year, and the year before that, he only got off one start. So it seems like Tommy John is such a scary surgery. You never know what you're going to get coming back. But Mm -hmm. it's kind of like some of these guys in football with ACL surgeries. Some of these guys come back better and stronger. And just to see him come back after that Tommy John at 39 years old and go eight inning shutout pitching that no-no, man, it was just so impressive to see. You're right, future Hall of Famer, no doubt. How cool is that, too, that, you know, 39 years old, I'm, I'm reading these stats, he was trying to tie Sandy Koufax. Jeez. For man. second on the career no hitter list, Nolan Justin, Ryan number one. Yeah, Nolan Ryan is number one with seven. Man, I mean, look, there are pitchers that pitch their whole careers and don't come close. Never come close to a right. no hitter bid. And this dude right. has six. Unbelievable. What? <laughs> what are we doing, man? Excellence. <laughs> that's that's domination right there. Like the dude is awesome, and <sighs> and you pitch one one game. In the last two years, and then I'm looking at at his stat four and one this season with the 1.55 ERA through oh, six starts. Throwing like smoke, what? Man. Like Absolutely. what? Maybe that maybe those couple years off added to added to his his longevity. You yeah. know, maybe that helped preserve him maybe a couple more years. Like you don't see guys that old pitching that dominantly. 1.55 ERA. Are you kidding? That's a great point. You look at just the landscape of sports. Now, you're seeing some of these professional athletes play longer at a high level. Maybe again after this Tommy John surgery, two years of rest and recuperation. Who knows? Maybe Verlander ends up pitching another two, three solid seasons. Listen to this. Dusty Baker said Verlander was on a a 90 pitch limit. Okay. But they would have extended, you know, Mm -hmm. past the eight innings if if he Mm -hmm. continued his no no hit bid. Yep. He struck out five, walked two on 89 pitches through eight innings. He Jeez. went eight innings and only pitched 89 pitches. Stop it. What? What are we doing? He was get, bringing them up, sitting them down last night. Man. Man, just, that is a frustrating night for the Twins. Speaking of, so up on ESPN, just real quick, I wanted to share this with you. I don't know if you saw it. They've got the top 10 rookies of the MLB season thus far. The Twins have not one but two names in that collective group. Do you want to take a guess which rookies they they might be? Well, I know Smoking Joe is one of them. No doubt. That's one. Number four on the top 10 list, Joe Ryan, number four. Uh, I'll give you a hint. They're both pitchers. All right, so you got Joe. Who's the other pitcher that's been throwing some cheese, man? Not a starter. So don't call him Roberto, but he's Duran. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Duran. Number four and seven best rookies, respectively, in That's the MLB. Awesome. According to the ESPN latest rankings article, kind of cool, breaks down what they've done so far, their 2022 outlook, and then also their long-term outlook for the distant future. Noting Ryan has developed into a great innings eater at worst, something the Twins desperately needed heading into the year. As far as Duran goes, they call him a relief ace pitcher right now at 6'5", throwing a 
100 plus miles an hour with the potential to move into the starting rotation at some point. A lot of a hmm. uh, lot of obviously young excitement on the Twins roster, not just in the pitching pool, but in the batter's box as well. In your opinion, Reggie, who's got the bigger upside right now? Is it Joe Ryan or is it Duran? You know, you you always become a little leery of guys pitching 100 plus that they don't tear the smithereens out of their arm. Um, I I do think that he is a very, very promising pitcher, and I think they should continue to develop him and just kind of see where the natural progression of things lands him in the future like he that would be great if he you know becomes a a a starting pitcher in the rotation but also like it's great to have a guy like that coming out of the bullpen as well that you know that can eat up an inning or two you know have a maybe he can be like a long reliever or maybe you bring him in the close like you just you you carve out a, a a position for him that really suits his skills well but I think it's Joe Ryan if if you're talking about a guy who can be an innings eater mm-hmm. at worst, like that is that is pretty good. Like anytime you can say, you know what, I know regardless of what happens, he's gonna go out there and give me six, seven, maybe eight innings from time to time. Like I, I know we can count on him to to really kind of let the relievers kind of, you know, chill for for a game because they won't have to do much because he's going deep into these innings. And so I think he has, like, the the potential to to really be a, a dude out of that starting rotation. And I, I think the sky is the limit as long as he continues to develop. The number one rookie so far, Jeremy Pena for the Astros, their shortstop, who coincidentally enough took over for who Carlos Correa mm. must be nice having a smooth transition Dang. going from Carlos Correa and not skipping a beat. I guess this guy's been unbelievable, Gold Glove candidate already. Just a Dang, no, like Carlos who? Yeah, who? exactly. Yeah, who you can have him. You can have him. <laughs> Take it. All right. Well, the time has come. My favorite segment is here. I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat, covering all the latest hot topics in Minnesota sports called What Does It Mean? Reggie, you ready to roll? Let's do it. First up, what does it mean with Reggie? Tom Brady is in the news again, not for football-related purposes on the field, but off the field. He just signed a 10-year, $375 million deal with Fox to join the broadcast booth when he retires. What does it mean for the likelihood Brady now retires for sure after the 2022 season, knowing this is waiting for him? And I'm just curious, as a broadcaster, sports broadcaster yourself, what does it mean for former players, turn broadcasters in general? And I guess just even on a broader scope, what does it just mean for sports broadcasting when you see a guy like this sign that kind of contract? Man, where do I even start on this one? I don't know. Lot Lot to touch on here. So I preface this by saying... Uh, my wife has this saying, you know, when we talk about things, we like, look, I ain't no hater because, you know, like, right. I, I ain't no hater. So, so Tom, like, get go your be, money. Yeah, go, go be get yours. yours. Do, do your thing, man. Like, I, I'm not mad at you for this. But, dude, favor ain't fair. Mm. Favor ain't fair. Like, you, you, you play this position 10 Super Bowls. You know, you're considered the greatest of all time. And it's just like, now you got to transition to to some other lane and be compensated as like the greatest of all time there as well. Like quarterbacks make the biggest salaries in all of football Mm -hmm. sustained throughout their career. The biggest salaries. Guaranteed so, money. As soon as you yeah. sign the contract, boom, 60 so mil. So he's paid, yep. okay? Yep. And then you transition to a new career, by the way, that you have no experience in, and they give you $375 million. You're making more money as a broadcaster than you did as a quarterback, or or at least comparable no, like, it's more. I, th- I think three hundred and thirty-three million was the number that's going to get flung out if he retires this year. He's going to make more money, like you said, Reggie, than the twenty-two years playing quarterback in the NFL combined. Unbelievable, and that is that is nuts, nuts. for a network to shell out that type of money for a guy who you don't even know is going to be good or not. Mm-hmm. Like we haven't seen Tom Brady do TV. 
in this role at all. And you're giving him $375 million over 10 years. And it's like, look, you got to pay to play because it's like, if they didn't do it, I'm sure someone else oh, would have. No doubt. You know, Amazon or or someone else would have ponied up. But what I think is crazy is like, you have no idea when Tom Brady is going to retire. Like, he could play this year and and he's like, oh, man, I, I felt pretty good this year. I think I'll give it another go. Like, he could play two, three more years and you're just you're just like waiting on this guy to come and be the guy for you and you've given 10 10 years 375 million dollars like here's my thing and I tweeted about it yesterday there are other broadcasters in this industry who have the formal TV training who have the experience 10 12 plus years of experience and they're not sniffing anything close to that I mean, they're, you're, you're talking about, I know people that are making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year in TV, and they've been doing this for 15, 16 years. And you just got a guy who steps right off the playing field, and, and you're giving him $37.5 million. Jeez. Like, it, it is just, I think sometimes it's just like, look, okay, like, we get it. Like, these guys have played the game. They're analysts, and there's a premium on guys who can break down the game for fans. And I get that. But when you talk about, like, him sitting in the booth next to Kevin Burkhart, and he's making triple, quadruple of what Kevin Burkhart's salary is, like, I don't know about that. Like, something, something's off with that, you know? Like, and, and Kevin Burkhart is one of the premier broadcasters – in the television industry. And so, like I said, I'm not hating on TB12, like, make your money, dude, like, do your thing. But, like, dang, man, like, you couldn't just fade to Bolivia, as Mike uh, Tyson <laughs> said one time. Like, you, you just can't fade to Bolivia, uh, you know, with your family and, and just enjoy the fam. And funny enough, somebody made the comment, like, Tom Brady spent a month with his family, and he just said, you know what, no more. No more. The heck with that. Like, he he went back to football and then he signed a deal that solidified what he's doing after football as well. Like I'm not doing that again. I had enough. I'm not a family man. I'm not I'm not a, a present dad. I'm 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 dedicated to a craft. If it's not football, it's gonna be broadcasting. And I and I think too, you know, wrapping up thought, he's a very competitive dude. And you got these other quarterbacks and these other broadcasters like Troy Aikman, like Tony Romo, like Chris Collinsworth. You know, now Kirk uh, Herbstreet is going to be on Amazon. Like, Tom is not going to want to be second fiddle to any of those guys. So I know that he has the competitive nature to attack this, you know, work ethic wise to be great. But you look at it like no matter how much you prepare, no matter how much you you try to be, you know, great. Like even the great Tony Romo was was just, you know, heralded for his knowledge. I think he's regressed kind of towards the mean. He just kind of says, you know, pretty, pretty much like, you know, broadcaster speak, if you will. Like he's he's not saying anything too enlightening anymore. And I think what we saw with Jason Witten is, man, TV is hard. TV is like I do this every day and I have to work at it every day because people just think, oh, you just got such an easy job. You just, you know, get on TV and talk about whatever for a living. But no, you got to be creative. You got to be entertaining. You got to be informative. You got to, you know, have an obligation to, to tell people the truth. You know, like not that what Tom Brady is doing is, quote unquote, journalism, you know, as opposed to what I'm doing. But like. Tom could work at this as hard as he could, and he could still not be good at it. That's the thing with TV. Like, it's just, it, it takes a, a certain type of person to be good at this, and we'll we'll see what happens. Can't be mad at Tom Brady, like you said. More mad at the system itself. Like you said, somebody else was going to pay him all that money, too. Uh, you can't blame him for taking all that money, but... Uh, it's a hard pill to swallow, man. Like you said, if you're Kevin Burkhardt sitting right next to him, you put in your 20, 25 years of service, and then this guy comes in with no experience making you obliterating. Triple, yeah, triple, obliterating your salary Dude, out of yeah. the water. I right, just think real, it's a little tired. I think it's a little tired for, uh, and, uh, and just a little unoriginal from some of these broadcast networks that are, mm -hmm. they're just like, 
oh, let's just let's hire a, a former like you look across the board at ESPN, TV. FS1, all that. Like they're just hiring these former athletes to be these personalities and all that stuff. And it's just like, come on, man. I mean, I get it. You you say that they're qualified because they played the game, but it's like there are other people who are are qualified to be in these broadcast roles that you don't even sniff paying them. I mean, like, I looked at, like, Stephen A. Smith, love him or hate him, he's one of the hardest working people in this business. And he's making $10 mil a year, which is nothing to sneeze at. Mm -hmm. But, like, you got Brady making 37.5. Like, he's making 27 plus million dollars more than Stephen A. Smith. And Stephen A. Smith is literally a fixture on our televisions every single day. It started with Romo, remember? Romo kind of mm -hmm. set the precedent. And the, here's the thing. Romo's good. I like Romo. He's yeah. really in depth. But everybody just assumed, oh, if, if they can do it with Romo, we can do it with anybody. And, and mm -hmm. not everybody's a Tony Romo. I'm sure Tom Brady will be great. He'll give great insight. Here's the new lineup now. CBS, Jim Nance, and Tony Romo. Fox, Kevin Burkhart, Tom Brady, NBC, Mike Tirico, Chris Collinsworth, ESPN, now they got Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, Amazon, you mentioned, Kirk Herbstreet, who I'm excited about, and Al Michaels. You can only watch one the rest of your life. Which one are you picking? No explanation needed. I mean, all right, no explanation needed. Go ahead. I'm going Buck and Aikman. I'm going Nansen Romo. Okay. I'm excited, though, to see Kirk Herbstreit. I'm very excited. Can't really go wrong with any of them. Again, Brady going to be interesting. All right, next one up. What does it mean? Former All-Pro linebacker Luke Keekley said on ESPN, he thinks the Love Vikings me some Luke. will have the best secondary in the NFL mm. thanks to the perfect blend of veteran leaders and Patrick Peterson, Harrison Smith, and young, raw talent the Vikings just drafted and rookie Lewis Seen and Andrew Booth Jr. What does it mean when predicting – what the Vikings' pass defense will actually look like in 2022. I mean, we haven't heard that high a praise from any expert when it comes to the Vikings' defense that ranked near the bottom in nearly every category last year. I think it's encouraging. Mm -hmm. I think it's really encouraging, really promising, because, you know, going into the draft, everyone was talking about they need to draft a cornerback. They need to do it. You know, they – they had the Bashad Breeland experiment fail last year, you know, and you got Cam Dantzler back there and Patrick Peterson is is aging a bit and they had to address the position. I think drafting Lewis Seen was a little bit of a luxury for them because they did have Harrison Smith and they did have Cameron Bynum um, ascending mm -hmm. as well. And so, like, you draft Lewis Cena, and you're just like, oh, okay, like, okay, we're going to bulk up this secondary. And so, and then, you know, what a lot of people thought was a first-round talent in Andrew Booth Jr., you got him in the second. And you're like, hmm, if this kid can stay healthy, he seems motivated, too, you know, after listening to him talk after the draft. Like, he seems motivated to want to be one of the best corners in the NFL. And I mean, he has the talent to do that. You know, it was a lot of people talking about him being, you know, one of the best cover corners in the entire draft. And so under Patrick Peterson's, you know, tutelage, kind of showing him the rope, showing him the game and, and kind of helping him along as, as he continues to try to be, you know, a top tier cornerback in this league, even, you know, at his, advanced age I think it's very encouraging to see what this unit could be like when you you know put scene in there with Harry and with Bynum and Dantzler and Pat Pete and Booth Jr like now you're talking about a team with a little bit of depth here and a team that can make some noise when you're talking about going against the Packers who you, you're not really sure who Aaron Rodgers is going to throw to and now you got the Lions with St. Brown and Jamison Williams who you're going to have to defend, and then, you know, whoever the, the Bears got, you know, I mean, whatever. I think it, it gives the Vikings some confidence that they can compete against these teams in the division. It's funny in the NFL because you can go worst to first in any mm – -hmm. if you have one good draft in offseason, you can just – completely change the entire vibe and landscape of your team offensively defensively vikes obviously went defensive heavy in this draft mm -hmm. one of the worst defenses in the league but they just added a lot of young talent and speed i mean this game now is all about speed lewis seen and andrew booth jr can fly around 
But like Luke Keekley mentioned, I think the whole reason this comes together so well is because of the nice little balance, the sprinkle of veterans, PP mm -hmm. and Harry, that can teach these young guys and get them acclimated quickly yeah. so they don't have that you know long, slow, developing rookie season. They can just come out and stop thinking and just go play sooner mm -hmm. than later. Like A lot of rookies just can't say because they don't have that kind of veteran leadership on their team. Going to be interesting for sure. Last one, what does it mean? ESPN draft experts were asked to predict the offensive rookie of the year christian watson tied titans wide receiver Traylon burks for the most votes seahawks running back kenneth walker and steelers quarterback kenny pickett were second and third in voting respectively what does it mean when predicting this year's rookie of the year i'm not doing this with you luke <laughs> i'm not doing like these dudes have not even took the field yet <laughs> Like, I'm not doing this. It means that we have no idea right now. Well, like, this, these are one of the things that, that kind of irked me about, you know, some of the, you know, we're just trying to drum up some type of, uh, of, of content in the offseason while we're waiting on seeing these guys for real. Like, these guys haven't taken a snap yet with their respective new teams. Some of them haven't even signed their rookie contracts yet. And we're talking about, whether or not they're going to be rookie of the year, I think is way, way too soon. There are draft pundits saying that Traylon Burks is, is kind of green, so don't expect a whole lot from him So you know, to start. You know, a lot of people saying Christian Walk Watson is green, and, you know, he's got to develop chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. Like, all of these things remain to be seen. I do like Kenneth Walker uh, for the Seahawks, and I think – they're going to be relying heavily on the run now that they don't have Russell Wilson anymore, kind of get back to being that that run-dominant team. And I think Kenneth Walker is a great fit for them. Me too. So I'm, I'm excited to see what he does up there. And, you know, Kenny Pickett may not even see the field with money-making Mitch out there in, in Pittsburgh. So it's hard to predict these things. And I, I appreciate ESPN trying to drum up, you know, some excitement and drum up some, some talkers, some conversation. But I'm not falling for it. We're not doing this today. It's just grassman at straws. They're trying to put the pieces together, connect the dots. Okay, Packers move on from their number one wide receiver. They have an MVP, reigning MVP at quarterback. He's got to throw it to somebody. Hmm, they draft Christian Watson. Maybe he's the favorite. But you're right. We haven't seen anything yet. And I don't know if necessarily like rookie OTAs and even training camp can really glean and show you that much. No. So really, no. you don't really know until you start to get a few weeks into the season. But of course, as they always say, NFL is king. Mm -hmm. We're talking NFL 365 every day of the week. All right, Reggie, you survived the gauntlet. Back here tomorrow previewing the Wild and Blues game six and some more Twins baseball. They're hosting the Astros tonight. Chris Archer on the mound. First pitch at 6.40 p.m. Remember to subscribe to a YouTube channel and join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. He's Reggie Wilson. Follow him on Twitter at Reggie Wilson TV and on CARE 11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Tune in tomorrow to another Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing Big out. levels. Be blessed. Mm. Spread love today. This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota.